Double down. Yes. Hey everyone, Hathematics here. In my last video, I went over Shade Binder and how it paired so well with Trace Rifles. I discussed the why, but I didn't really focus on the how. Now I'd like to change that. Let's get ready to embrace, embrace the trace. trace. But first I wanna ask you a question. How many times have you seen a shark fighting a bear on dry land? If the answer's more than once, you might wanna invest in a GoPro. Things are a much bigger threat when they're inside of their natural habitat. Obviously a shark is a much greater threat inside of the water rather than out. In this video, I'll help you identify this build's natural habitat in order to put yourself in the best position to succeed. So let's talk about how to use a trace rifle, its strengths and weaknesses. When using a trace rifle, it's important to remember that these guns are extremely accurate while both ADS and hip fires. Oftentimes, it's more beneficial to hip fire these guns so you can have increased mobility while in the middle of an engagement. That's extremely important when it comes to positioning and understanding how to react to a pushing shotgunner. I like to engage people within the ranges that I can freeze them, which is roughly between 20 to 25 meters. I can engage up to 30 meters, but I don't like to. Anywhere below 20 meters puts me in danger of being caught by a behemoth's advanced mobility, and I wanna try my best to keep that gap between me and the opposition at all times. This means a lot of releasing ADS and prescribing to the two second rule. I'm going to link an incredible video for my good buddy Ascendant Nomad in the description below. The two second rule is this. If no target presents themselves in your current field of view within two seconds, move away from the current position and take up a new one. I like to expand that two second rule to remind myself to release ADS within two seconds to make sure that I'm constantly looking at my radar to scan for additional enemies. If you haven't seen this video, it's a must see, a great way to improve your overall crucible awareness. But back to the build. I approach this build like I would if I was using a fusion rifle. I want to prevent pushing near corners because corners are what I call shotgun country. What I mean by that is, if I'm navigating a map and there's a 90 degree turn, I always take a wide berth around to create distance between me and a potential shotgunner who may be sliding at me. This gives an opportunity for me to hip fire my primary or use stasis to stop them before they can close the deal. While shotgunners worship the W key, the S key is your best friend with this build. Now I mentioned that I treat a trace rifle like I would if I was using a fusion rifle. What I mean by that is both of them operate within a similar range and both have similar TTK when factoring in the charge up time from fusion. Stasis also has similar range to a fusion rifle and I wanna be within my weapon's optimum TTK to secure a stasis kill before they thaw. You're gonna be living in the buffer between you and your aggressor. Keep that optimum distance between you and your enemy at all times and you'll be in great position to succeed. I am constantly looking at my radar and listening for audio cues. If I see radar blips pushing through blind spots coming towards me, I often lead with a predictive cold snap to cut off their approach. Airborne targets continue their momentum. There's been plenty of times that I'll hit a dawn blade that conveniently slides directly into the open and right into my trace rifle. Many people will call this build cheese and rip you for using it. It doesn't matter. The build is in the game. Use whatever, don't apologize. Understand that your in-game awareness is the skill gap with this build. The more cerebral your approach, the better the results will be. Get yourself mentally dialed in. Destiny 2 throws a ton of information at you at once, and it's important to be able to digest that information quickly and consistently. This means constantly glancing up at your radar to track enemy movements while listening for sound effect cues like jumping, sliding, fusion rifle charging, etc. This build does not work without paying attention to what the game is telling you. A lot of these stasis plays that you'll see in the background are coming from me predicting what the enemy is going to be doing based on their movement behavior and loadout. A lot of this translates over from my time as a defender titan in D1 trying to line up suppressor grenades. Also, a lot like suppressor grenades, the hardest enemies to predict are the ones with the most erratic movement. Dawn blades and behemoths are very tough. Cold snaps do not have a lot of height, so you're best to deal with airborne enemies with your melee. 
So now that we've reviewed trace rifle positioning, creating distance and operating within that buffer, I wanna focus specifically on shade minder and stasis behaviors. Let's review what grenades you should be running. Glacier grenade is completely out for this build. The trace rifle takes entirely too long to break stasis crystals and you'll waste all of your ammo shooting at the, at the crystals that you're making and the enemy will just thaw and get away. While Dustfield is an option, it's still inferior to Cold Snap for Shadebinder. The entire point of this build is to create a way to shatter enemies quickly, consistently, and safely. Dustfield's adjustments were warranted, and now Cold Snap is the clear grenade choice for Shadebinder. Now let's talk about the Rift. You're stationary when you cast it, the AoE is not huge, and the timing's tricky. The best way to master it is to do what I do. Challenge each and every super that you see in 6v6. Try to freeze them out of their super with your rift, and you'll get the practice that you need to master this skill. In the clips here, you'll notice that I'm using my rift defensively, but I'm predicting enemy movement and timing it based on enemy tendencies. This is just something that I've picked up over intense practice over the last several weeks. Now listen, I don't always get it. There's probably way more rifts that I'll cast that I freeze no one. But in order to put yourself in the best position, you want to be casting your rift on or near a corner where someone can't see you and they're probably pushing you with a shotgun. If you can understand the enemy's position and their tendency of trying to get that kill quickly, you can use that tendency against them and turn the ties in your favor. So let's talk about the super now. The Shade Binder super is very slow moving but the projectiles have excellent tracking capabilities. If you're using Shade Binder in 3v3, you'll want to pop this super from cover while within your normal engagement range of, you know, roughly 25 meters. Do not be on the ground when you're in the super. You want to be in the air for a few reasons. First is, you'll want to be able to see over cover to give your projectiles the best chance to hit someone that's hiding. Next is that airborne targets are harder to hit. Walking through a doorway on the ground will leave you at traditional head level. With the decreased movement speed, you are begging to get sniped out of your super. Any chance you get, be in the air, be moving around, and just make it harder for the enemy to get that headshot kill. Before you pop your super, you're going to want to tell your team where the enemy is, what direction you're pushing from, and ask them to be ready to cut the enemy off. Even if you don't register a kill with your super, Flushing the enemy into an ambush that creates kills is an effective utilization of it. Shadebinder is among the best supers in the game for countering other supers. Just use cover to your advantage, create space, and let your projectiles do their thing. About the only supers that you really have to worry about is Golden Gun and Middle Tree Arc Strider, which can reflect your projectiles back at you. Outside of that, Shadebinder is a wonderful counter for basically every other super in the game. So now that we know that Cold Snap is the best grenade, let's talk about how to use that and how to pair it with your melee. I mentioned earlier that I'm always trying to use radar and sound cues to my advantage, but using your abilities within their intended range is extremely important. Your abilities have slow cooldowns and wasting them on enemies that are outside of a standard engagement means that you're significantly less effective until those abilities recharge. You should not be tossing Hail Mary grenades 50 meters away. Even if you happen to freeze someone with them, you're unlikely at best to secure the kill before they fall. Another thing to mention, understand where your target is in relation to their team. If they are all grouped together, beautiful. Lead with stasis and get ready for the inevitable team wipe when ice flare bolts change for the rest of their team. However, if they're using proper distance, be careful not to overcommit in an attempt to secure that first kill. Very easy to get caught flat-footed and get killed, leaving your team at the disadvantage. Cold snap grenades have about a five meter travel distance and they track up walls. However, they do not go through Titan barricades. If you're playing control and you happen to see an enemy capping a point, throw your grenade near the point and push with your trace ready. You'll be shocked at how frequently you'll get three or even four kills from a single grenade. Your penumbra blast melee has a range of approximately 21 meters. Now, knowing what that range is and understanding what that looks like in game are two completely different things. So before I go into trials, I like to hop into a private match on the scheduled map for that weekend and use the heavy ammo box as a distance marker for myself. I'll rotate around it to make sure that I understand what 21 meters looks like from multiple engagement areas. 
This helps me improve my distance estimation in game. Also, anytime an enemy drops special ammo or heavy ammo, you can use the distance readout on that ammo brick to quickly realign your depth perception. This will also help with understanding ranges for optimum weapon TTK as well. Now that we've covered stasis, let's cover what trace rifle you should be using and what exotic armor you should be pairing with it. I sat down to evaluate as many exotics as I thought would make sense for this build. I tested Sanguine Alchemy, Vesper of Radius, Claws of Ahamkara, Eye of Another World, The Stag, Verity's Brow, and Nezarak Sin. Let's clear the deck right now. Verity's Brow does not work with this build. Don't use it, doesn't work. Most of the kills that you're going to be getting will be registered as weapon kills, not grenade kills. It completely invalidates Verity's Brow entirely. Do not use it. It looks like crap anyway. It looks like a fan-made alien movie. It looks like you got a face hugger on. Nobody wants to look like crap in this game. I mean, honestly, Destiny is the end game, so just let's move on. I'm gonna lump Sanguine Alchemy, Vesper of Radius, and the Stag together since they're all designed to buff the Rift. The Rift is the hardest ability of the three to use, and in my opinion, you should not be dedicating an exotic on something that's tough to utilize, especially when other exotics exist that can buff your Rift's recharge while also increasing recharge rates of me melee and grenade too. Claws of Ahamkara is a solid third option and is something that some players could elect to pick over my choices. I personally would rather have better recharge rates for all abilities versus just gaining a second melee charge. If Claws also buffed melee recharge rates or had any other perk, it would be a serious contender for the best exotic selection. However, since it's just the second melee charge, you can do better. That leaves the last two as Nezarak Sin and Eye of Another World. Nezarak Sin buffs ability recharge rates on void weapon or ability kills. Now, since Wave Splitter is a void trace rifle, if you're planning to use Wave Splitter, it's a wonderful choice. However, I have another world buffs all ability recharge rates. My buddy Noise Tank just did an epic breakdown on this that taught me something. The ability recharge buff granted by I have another world goes even further beyond tier 10. It's a plus 30 to recovery, strength, and discipline. This is awesome for stasis seeing how the ability recharge rates are slower than the other classes. So now that we know the two best exotic armor pairings, what trace rifle should we be using? If you're using Prometheus Lens, I would go with Eye of Another World. In case you missed the last video, I mentioned that while Wave Splitter has a faster TTK on paper, I found Prometheus Lens to be a more consistent weapon. I also like that Prometheus added rounds directly to the magazine on kills, which helps when chaining kills in between enemies hit by Ice Flare Bolts. Also, since Prometheus Lens had a catalyst, it was capable of creating Orbs of Light, which can trigger high energy fire, then buffing my primary weapon in cleanup scenarios. However, I hadn't looked deeply enough at Wave Splitter. Wave Splitter's exotic perk, Harmonic Laser, means that the DPS varies while the trigger is held down. There's three different intensity levels that vary, and collecting an orb of light will throw it into a supercharged battery mode, which maximizes the DPS. The issue that I have with this gun is that the fluctuating damage means that your TTK varies too much for my personal liking. Also, the supercharged battery timer is too short for it to be effective in a 3v3 environment. One orb will only grant you five seconds of supercharge, while grabbing a second orb will extend the duration up to a maximum of 10 seconds. Oftentimes, it's not even enough for me to be able to get an enemy in my sights based on respawns or an enemy's sword peeking or whatever. Uh, it's just not something that really came into play in 3v3 at all. It's a little bit more effective in 6v6, depending on the map, but it's very niche. So when I compare the two exotic perks, adding rounds directly to the magazine seems like the better choice to me. But since Wave Splitter is a void trace rifle, what happens when paired with Nezarak Sin? Well, it really depends. In 6v6 or matches that you're absolutely fragging out, it's better than Eye of Another World. You can get your super back faster, you get your abilities back faster. The problem is that requires you to frag out, which is variable. When I'm making builds, I like to have a predictable recharge rate, so Eye of Another World is my personal preference especially for 3v3. My suggestion, use Prometheus Lens and Eye of Another World in 3v3 and use Wave Splitter plus Nezerax in 6v6. So now the last question is, is this build viable in 3v3? And the answer is yes. The rest of this video is going to be spent breaking down specific plays from my trials weekend and showing how I used this build in order to overcome a situation.
This first play focuses on distance, awareness, and understanding player tendencies. In this clip from Trials, I land a melee hit on an enemy, then quickly clean them up with my trace rifle. But how did that happen? I see them blink up to B and see that my grenade tracking missed. Based on the distance of a typical blink, I land up a shot where I expected them to land and shot at a height that would hit them whether they were running, jumping, or sliding. I can't even see the enemy when I throw the melee, but based on game sense, I knew where they would be. They're using a shotgun, and a shotgunner wants to close the gap while minimizing their time spent outside of cover. This means that when they round the corner on B, they'd likely be hugging the wall to create the shortest distance between two points. My game sense prevails, and we got that first kill. I pushed up to grab the ammo, then called for my teammate to fall back to me since they're too close to the doorway for their loadout. I'm positioned behind my teammate while keeping an eye for a side flank. I want to keep distance between me and my ally to make sure that if he dies to a shotgunner, I still have enough distance in between us to clean up the aggressor. The enemy gets a melee slam on him, but I clean up the kill. I immediately release ADS to check radar to regain enemy positioning. I hear fire directly to my left and can tell that they're right around the corner. My ally dies and I know they're gonna push. I stand right at the edge of the wall and cast my rift, which freezes them as they push up the B, and I close the round out with a team wipe. The second play here is a long play near heavy spawn, focusing on fight or flight, understanding distance, ammo management, and enemy res control. I start behind a box and know that the enemy's at the door. My one teammate died, and the other is taking a long route around for a flank. I slide out and see that there's special ammo brick at 13 meters, and that the enemy is just beyond the staircase near that ammo. This tells me that they are in range for my melee, so I let it rip and then move to the left to break line of sight in order to play my life. I'm aware that I have no ammo left, so I have to engage with an SMG and hope for the best. I'm in a 1v2 situation here, so I know that if I die, the enemy is going to get the res and leave my teammate in a 1v3, so I have to play conservatively. The primary ammo damage nerf prevents me from cleaning up either kill, and I have to bail. I jump back to the box to reload my weapons and use the left wall to create soft cover, then pop out to melt the enemy that just got rezzed. I know I'm low on ammo, so I switch to my SMG and follow the enemy through the air to get the second kill. Once I get that second kill, I push aggressively while reloading to activate kill clip and help my teammate clean up the third to end the round. This third play focuses on utilizing cover, understanding aggressive player tendencies, and creating distance. This play starts with me using my cold snap grenade and immediately pushing after it to secure the first kill with my trace rifle. I see my teammates die in the middle and guess that someone's going to push me. I waste a lot of my ammo here trying to prevent the aggressive push, then reposition to reload behind the boxes. The key to this play though is understanding that the enemy is going to push me and backing up to improve my visibility around the boxes. By backing up, I'm able to freeze the hammer titan who would have tried to shoulder charge me. Had I stayed up against the box, I wouldn't have had time needed to react to their push. The important part is to step back to continue to be in cover from any of the enemies while still being able to use the box to break the line of fire. Once I get that kill, I move to enemy three who floats up in the air with their dead man's tail and I track them to close out the round. I took this build into Trials of Osiris this weekend and had about 15 team wipes in 12 matches. Again, the build is only as good as your in-game awareness, so if you're looking to improve that awareness, I've linked a few helpful videos in the description below. That's all for this week's episode. Like, comment, and sub to save a life, and remember to embrace, embrace the trace. trace.